The vision for this project was to bring together artists, craftsmen, historians, and curators, each with a singular degree of knowledge and a lifelong immersion in their respective fields. To me, Brahms is vulnerability and the utmost unified expression. The sonatas in particular are a sort of uh, tapestry woven both of the heart and the mind. And the equipment of the era really mirrors these qualities, both metaphorically and physically. Uh, after all, the culture was such that evenness, projection, all of these kind of modern qualities, they were not the highest values. All you have to do is try playing an authentic gut D string from the era, which is quite thick, and the point becomes clear. You have to take a different approach. Um, so by learning how to use the equipment, so to speak, you're actually getting a glimpse into the values of that era. So if one is able to meet these challenges and have some occasional kind of glimmers of, of magic when, when everything lines up, that really stays with you. And it's gonna stay with me for the rest of my life uh, as I continue to play these pieces. Welcome to the Frederick Collection of Historical Grand Pianos. And this is what we call our Historical Piano Study Center. It is loosely referred to as a museum by many people, but we tend not to use that term ourselves because a museum usually is just to walk through looking at things, and heaven forbid you should touch any musical instruments on display there. The pianos that are in good playing condition include pianos by some of the major European makers. The French maker Erard is well represented here. I think we have seven Erard pianos in this building. There are maybe three or four of them that we will play for people. Uh, in Vienna, the, the Streicher pianos, we have three of those, and we usually play at least two of those. Uh, the earlier pianos include, a, well, we have three Bösendorfer pianos in the collection. When you get to the earliest pianos, the touch is so light that even people who are uh, professional pianists sometimes have trouble adjusting their fingers to the lightness of the touch. We have to explain to them that the muscles in your arms are for holding your arm away from the keyboard and you just drop your fingers into the keys as you go by. Think of it as the bowing arm of a cellist and that you're moving horizontally and that there should be no vertical motion in order to play these pianos. Just, you're just playing basically from the large knuckle down to the fingertips. Mm. That's all the weight it takes for the Beethoven generation pianos. Some people, even though they would be perfectly capable of playing them, have this sort of, I guess maybe they've been conditioned by going to too many museums and they just think they shouldn't be touching these. There's some kind of a, like a taboo against playing them. And we say that's what these are for, is so you can hear them. Before we had this facility, this old library building, and of course this is when we had both children at home. When we moved here, our daughter was six years old and our son was ten. Um, when we would have a group of people come through the house, it was crowded. For example, if we wanted to have a concert with the Erard piano that you see over here, this is from 1893, that one is the piano that is right there. Now the only way to get that out of the house was obviously always tip a piano like this over on its side on a dolly to move it. But it meant we had to move that one into the corner as far as it would go. Once this was on its side, then we could move this one forward that way. And then this could wheel out through here, through here, through here. Uh, we had to take down probably the play out piano in the dining room and move the Graf piano as close to the door as possible. <laughs> then the piano, the Erard on the dolly could get through here and here and go out through the kitchen through the woodshed where we had a door on the back. Well, we know some of the story, but if you'd like to share just how you acquired this instrument and how it came into your life and just what, uh, what are, what's unique about it. At that point, I had a finder in Vienna and uh, he knew what I was looking for and I was looking for the kind of 
uh, Stryker the Brahms had. Basically, the only thing that's not original are the strings. <laughs> Everything else is. I did not do what is done in modern rebuilding, which is where you rip out the sounding board and everything else and turn it into a modern piece of junk. I usually recommend that after that's been done, the piano should be burned. Because now it's not good for anything. It's a botched up relic. And the interesting thing about high quality soft tanned leather is it remains soft and flexible for a long, long time. And then you go after modern leathers that you hope were tanned by some process at least related to it and have that same kind of texture. And then at some point you have to, well, you have to rely on things such as a description of how you voice a piano from France in the 1830s. And he says, basically, uh, for most of the range, you try to get a sound that is merrily. I assume, you know, like a rich soup stock. Except in the treble, which you want a little bit sparkly. 19th century pianos and other instruments, typically somewhere at the top of the company, was somebody act who was actually a maker. Hmm. Or they knew the business while the things went up, and they had their own judgment. In other words, a Herr Blutner decides that how, what Blutner sound like. Herr Beckstein decides that uh, Beckstein's won't Those sound like. Those times. Yes, they are, and they have their own judgment. But when you have uh, somebody from the business school managing the thing, what you get is uh, playing by the numbers, which means simple-minded criteria about evenness and... Projection. Yeah, easy tunability and so on and so forth, which often doesn't have much to do with musicality. I mean, one reason that the older pianos are more expressive is when you change dynamic levels, you change the tone color slightly. That's the way a singer changes, too. And, that, and if you imagine a singer who sounded just as if somebody was playing with the volume control rather than right, right. why you can imagine what the effect is, with international competitions and everything else, and standardized criteria and whatnot. Things tend to sound the same no matter where they came from. One pianist would say, oh yes, of the two best German Steinways I've ever played, one was in Amsterdam and the other one was in Shanghai. Yes. <laughs> well, we had the same thing, we have the same thing in violin with tunings. At the time, the tunings were so free, like each city might have its own traditions yep. and it would vary. Yeah quite significantly. Before we were recording and we were exploring the, the exact pitch, right? And we started reading about uh, tuning in different German towns at the end of the 19th century. And of course, we didn't find the correct answer because they there were all, all so different. Yeah. Even because we were thinking three sonatas, so, and they're written across, you know, 10 years, let's say. So we say we found something approximating accurate for the first sonata, and but by the time it's the third sonata, the, the standards in Vienna were changing also. So it's, yeah, it was changing every place. It was, it's a it fluid was very situation. fluid. Um, if you went to a lecture, and somebody giving the lecture spoke in an absolutely perfect tone of voice for three quarters of an hour, fall asleep. What would happen? Yeah, everybody would fall asleep, <laughs> and. So there are places where you don't want things to be perfect. And I said, uh, the piano is, in a sense, a child of the Industrial Revolution ideal of perfection that gives us vinyl siding, astroturf, wall-to-wall -wall carpeting, Wonder Bread, yeah. you know, all these very even things. And in some areas that might be... Did we just compare Steinways to Wonder Bread? I think we did. We, we always right. used to. Favorably. Yeah, the first. Yeah. Yeah, we, we did. <laughs> a lot of what we're trying to do is, I don't know, preserve ecological diversity. I'll suggest some of the other possibilities that our particular culture rules out were well worth being interested in, paying attention to, and uh, so on and so forth. And I think people today often don't fully appreciate that. Um, they are, at the moment... They're well, used to thousands of white chickens. The, the balance between voice and piano had become 
something that you had to try compensating for the weight or, or the volume of the piano in order to provide reasonable balance. And when we began having these early pianos in our collection, and I was singing with them, I realized, oh, that's what the composer was working with. That's why the uh, singers, the, the leader, and French art songs and so on, balance. Pianos inevitably are going to have a bonk at the beginning of the sound. And then, unless you really work hard, they're going to drop off to a lower level. They may sustain for quite a while at that low level, but it's out of the way. This means if you're playing with a violin or a singer or a clarinet or whatever, why you can hear all the notes in the piano part. All right, your ear picks that up, hears those attack sounds, but it gets out of the way of the sustained instrument on top of it. So you hear the violin, singer, clarinet, whatever, and you hear them both and it balances. But this is contrary to the idea of trying to make a piano that imitates an electronic organ. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's where simple-minded technical definitions of perfection get in the way of you know, serious um, musical concerns. Typically, it the process is like, okay, here I have the theme, you play a little less, mm -hmm. let me, and then, okay, here you have the theme. And the music, yes, the music has these themes that are tossed back and forth, but the rest of the music is not like filler. You know, there's there's interesting, intricate things happening. Mm -hmm. And what I felt, and I don't know if you agree, but uh, when we were playing this, I don't think there was a lot of like, okay, you play less here. We never had to. Resolve. We never had to do that. And it comes out and just, just the way play. that... And that the way the, the instrument is is voiced, it's almost like those notes are just designed to come out. Mm -hmm. And then when you're not playing them, the other register, it, it just it takes care of itself. And you don't have to do all this yeah. kind of... Yeah, well, that's what the composer had. Yeah, at yeah. All. Yeah. yeah, right. Well, this is exactly what you were talking about, right? Because since the registers have diverging timbres, mm -hmm. then the, there's less of a piano sound as a monolithic, mm. loud um, mm. um, source of sound. And there, the there's a sort of an ins instrumentation, right, yeah. in the piano sound. And so you don't have the violin sound c competing with a wall of piano sound, but you have um, the various instruments of the different register yeah. um, playing in concert with the violin, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Also, another thing is if you have uh, a piano that changes tone color at dynamic levels, uh, you have an inner voice or something. On a piano that doesn't change tone color much, it means you really bang it out with the thumbs or do whatever you can to get the damn thing audible. Uh, on most of these pianos, you just think the right thoughts. Yes, yes, I can see that line there. I play that line, and everybody else hears it too. I'm old enough to remember this. Steinways, for example, used to sound a lot darker and mellower than they usually do now. And uh, hot young pianists in the 50s wanted a more brilliant metallic sound, and st the Steinway people said it sounded awful. <laughs> but all right, if you insist, we'll do it. Yes. And uh, they the whole aesthetic changed as a result. And uh, that became the, the standard. And the same thing went on with violin playing and singing and everything else. Uh, you know, in pop music, they really had more sense than they did in classical music. They realized if you want something that will make a sound that will fill a big auditorium to a deafening level, you don't waste time with acoustic musical instruments. Or if you do use them, you amplify like crazy, and once you have done that, you don't have to get tendonitis and carpal tunnel syndrome. You can make enough noise to deafen everybody in the audience right. without a sweat. Human standards are purely human. Right. They come and go. People find the truth wherever they are. It's like drilling, for, digging for water. You have to dig deeply, but almost any place it is down there someplace yes and it changes and sometimes it comes back and this is what 
the world is all about. And I think you, at this point, one has to figure about things like reviving earlier styles and performance and instruments and whatnot. There's a standard cliche in the arts and antiques business that goes something like, if you look at a copy of something made a generation or two ago, of whatever, it looks like the period when it really was made because this is the way people saw that kind of whatever, uh, or heard it, or whatever. And um, today, why it, and I have had this experience listening, oh yes, that's what we thought a harpsichord sounded like in the 1960s in Cambridge, Massachusetts. <laughs> I remember those days, half a century ago. Uh, and you know, the question about the long-term value is like that teapot. Is it really a beautiful thing? And yes, I think it really is. Well, it stands the test of time. And yeah, in other words, I remember seeing it at a show that I saw in the late 70s, and I still remember it, so, it's, yes. so it was good. I feel like the truth has to be a sort of um, a combination of what oh, yeah. Yeah, of what well, you know, otherwise what I you think feel. it'd be static. Yeah. And, well, uh, people, I mean, uh, ideology is a powerful thing. Like, people get onto an idea and it becomes them. So a lot of, like, period performance, re like, religious period performance people that are just hell-bent on doing every single thing, like yeah. it says in the yeah, Leopold Mozart. Or, I think a it's interesting but, effort in a lot of ways because all I hear of this a lot of the time is listening to what, oh, yes, that represents an aesthetic that was high style about 1930. Right. It's being inflicted on 17th and 18th century music. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and when you start reading about how they performed, unfortunately, it does not lend itself to neat rules. You have such things, it's, sometimes, it's the throwaway remarks that really give the mm -hmm. game away. Francois Couperin, why my harpsichord playing is so good. I play the right hand after the left hand. Simple. And the words, this is <laughs> all that horrible breaking of hands, which was a late romantic affectation. Yes. Your, your collection is something so unique, but it's situated not in the heart of London or New York, but mm -hmm. rather Ashburn, a, a, a very small town. And so I'm wondering how that dynamic plays out. You know, you've been here for a while and you, you know some of the residents here, I'm sure. And oh, yeah. how, what, what's their sort of perspective on having this here? Do they realize what it is? Or is it just this kind of thing that's curious? Like, what, yeah. how does that dynamic yeah. work? Um, I have talked, of course, with people from town about what we do. Many people in this town have no idea that we're even there. But, uh, they're the people that have come through the collection and, and done the tour in many cases are aware of, and some of them do come to our concerts, and uh, they are, I think, proud of what we do. They may not appreciate it at a level that, you know, you as musicians would, but they know that it's something special and they are glad to have something that is a positive thing to bring people to the town from all over. And I know when I go to pay our rent at Town Hall for the building, they are, you know, they they say something again, how lucky they are to have such good tenants in that build that town-owned building, mm -hmm. that it, it adds, you know, a certain cachet to the town to have something that's that special. So even if they don't know the intricacies of pianos and okay. like they. I think there's that sense that it's something special and oh, yeah. even oh, yeah. that kind and of... And we're glad to be where we are because if we were in some downtown you know, city area, for one thing, the rents would be out of sight. Sure. But uh, the other thing is that we don't want people just walking in off the street and banging casually on the pianos. Yes. This location means that if somebody wants to come here, they're going to have to set aside like an afternoon or a day, a whole day or something. And that means they're going to take it seriously. With the people that come out from Boston or that come up from New York or in from California or wherever, we get people from all over the world that do this tour because 
they are focused on this is something that is important to do that you know that I want for my own satisfaction and, and I've got to see this and hear this.
When playing an instrument like the Squarneri, you're grappling with an endless array of subtleties and complexities, um, particularly when using raw gut strings. So I found myself closer to kind of reconciling the secrets of the past with the faithfulness to my inevitably modern identity. This guy sort of falls in between the Amati model and his son's instrument, so it's a more powerful kind of sound, but um, mm -hmm. still has the basic Amati ingredients as well. He was not a very good businessman. He took the money that uh, his father had earned, they had bought a, a house um, and workshop um, right next to Stradivari and Amati in the same, in the same block. Um, but throughout this guy's lifetime, he gradually lost the family fortune and eventually lost the house. Um, little by little, he went into debt. Um, whether that was because he was a bad businessman, was whether that was because this other guy down the street called Antonio Stradivari was getting all the business or for economic reasons, um, it's hard to say. But um, it, it was sad because at a certain point, his, his, he had two sons. Um, the son, Del Jesu, Joseph Del Jesu, left the family workshop and, and went into another business briefly and then started making violins again, but not in the family workshop. He set out a, a workshop outside, separate from his father, which is very unusual in, in those days in, in, in North Italy. His older son, Pietro, left for Venice uh, to pursue um, you know, a career in that glamorous city. And uh, this guy actually did remain as a faithful son. Um, Joseph, the father, still made s scrolls for his son until, the, until he died in 1740. I would add that towards the end of his life, he was using cheaper materials. Um, this violin here is made with beautiful maple with these dramatic flames, which would have been expensive. This would have been imported from the Yugoslavia area Balkans. Later on, he used quite often local woods that would have been cheaper and sometimes were quite plain, not, not as fancy. That, that suggests he was selling more to, uh, maybe more to musicians rather than um, wealthy, wealthy people. Economic times were hard I, uh, in Cremona, and I think the main reason um, would have been that um, there was more competition from other countries for, mm -hmm. for instruments, number one. Number two, um, sometime short after this, this time, um, the French occupied Cremona, so there was a, basically they were occupied by a foreign power, so life would have been tough. Um, sort of right at the end of this guy's life. You know, violinists at that time uh, became international stars. There was a, such a huge, uh, they, they were fanatic about their violin playing. Um, this, this kind of musical theater, uh, sort of musical operas that they were doing in those days, um, it started, it basically started in Italy and took over all of, all of Europe. It became an obsession for the courts and wealthy people to have um, violinists. So, uh, and, and one of the most famous ones from Cremona became an international European star, um, celebrity really, on a level that's hard to imagine today. The violin is the cornerstone of Western classical music and some people would argue that it's one of the most um, enduring things that Western culture has created um, along with you know art and architecture you know music is is and violin the violin is the cornerstone of that so the, they've been going up in value consistently um, more and more you know in the since the 80s maybe since the 70s and 80s they've been going up faster than before um, I don't see that stopping I, I would say the only thing is as they gradually get broken and repaired and um, so forth, you know, that's a shrinking supply. And then there's also quite a few in museums. The sad thing is that most musicians can't afford the really great ones. So um, they're usually in the hands of patrons that lend them to musicians or the lucky people that find a way to get them. The, the Baroque movement has been around for quite some time. And um, 
has, has become more mainstream and is be, people are becoming, I would say, more, um, more fine musicians are attracted to that subject. Um, but what you bring up is the classical period and Beethoven and, and after. Uh, you bring up the idea of, well, what about Shostakovich or um, even earlier makers, you know, Rachmaninoff and so forth. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the concept of sound has changed so much since, even since the 19th, even in my active lifetime, even since the 70s and 80s, people are going more towards steel, steel type or these kind of strings that have this very piercing kind of sound and the whole setup is geared towards this kind of very direct, almost bright kind of sound. And musicians are using, have for some time been going more and more towards heavy pressure, bow pressure, forcing sound. And if you listen to the great old guys like Heifetz and Milstein and Kogan, and they let the violin sing. They have individual um, voices. Um, you know, I was just talking to a cellist who knew Casals, mm -hmm. and he was told him that the idea of a steel string, uh, to him, he would never consider. Mm -hmm. um, that he wanted just plain gut on his cello. So, congratulations. I think the idea you have is, is uh, should be paid attention to more. It was both a rewarding and a challenging journey to perform and record Brahms on period pianos. Without harping too much on the difficulties of adjusting to the mode of listening to yourself, adapting the touch, and sometimes even rethinking the entire interpretation of a certain passage. My distinct feeling in the end was that these instruments allow one to bring to the fore this stark contrast between the composer's private, intimate voice and his extroverted public musical rhetoric. In addition, of course, to helping realize the intricacies of Brahms's contrapuntal writing. To this latter point, while on a modern piano, finding ways to eliminate secondary inner voices is constantly a conundrum. On 19th century pianos, the timbral changes that occur naturally make those lines and textures clearly audible. So, I was able to think in terms of rhetorical gestures and phrases. In other words, I am letting the orchestration happen on its own, rather than focusing on a certain voice in hopes of achieving textural clarity and timbral differentiation. In this way, the 1868 striker naturally brings us closer to the sound world of Brahms and lets us witness his inherently polyphonic writing. For the D minor sonata, our decision to shift to the 1886 Chickering Concert Grand, which is a bigger and a more powerful instrument, allowed us to better convey the more dense and symphonic writing, and the overall heightened intensity of the piece. They are just beginning to be the modern grand. They still have all the color of the old ones, but they challenge you to reach deep beneath the surface to haul out all these beautiful, beautiful shadings and nuances and subtleties. We, in our time, in 2021, may look on this as a very special instrument, and indeed it is. It's a remarkable piano by any standard modern or old. But if you think of it in terms of its being a survivor of a great many pianos of great quality from the late 19th century, it actually takes on a somewhat different character. And that character is as a representative of a technology, an aesthetic, and an art that took the experimentative piano of the 18th century and the early 19th century into the first modern pianos in the 1860s and 70s. And by the time this piano was designed, 1877, um, we had truly the first modern grands and all the big companies were making pianos very similar to this. So this piano is not special in that it differs from the pianos of that time. What actually makes it very special is that it managed to survive, and not only survive in Dora Tongue, but survive 100% intact. And by intact, it means that its keys, its strings, the dampers, the felts, the hammers, 
and underneath an unimaginable amount of filth, even the original finish, that was on this Brazilian rosewood. Uh, almost the last year it was possible to get Brazilian rosewood, after which world supplies of that wood ceased to exist. They were gone. And in April of 1886, it was shipped from the manufactory on Tremont Street in Boston, Chickering and Sons, to their New York City showroom. And what detective work we've been able to do tells us that it probably left almost immediately for Hancock, New Hampshire, where it sat in the uh, First Congregational Church there for a uh, little over 100 years. Um, and a bit in detective work discovered something very strange and quite wonderful. All of the companies, especially Chickling, sent a partially finished instrument off to the Shrewu. The instrument was then bought, and typically, if you were a church, a concert hall, uh, a musician, an individual, you would then have it voiced to your taste. But for some reason, it appears to have left Chickering, the Chickering a shop in New York and gone up to New Hampshire without being finished voiced. So what we had was a bit of a time capsule of an instrument in its first rough shape. And that's how it survived in the late 1990s. Uh, at this point, the church, who had not used the instrument for 100 years, they'd stored it, called up a gentleman named Gene Rowe in, Han in Fitchburg, Massachusetts, and said, Mr. Rowe, we have a huge piano. How much do we have to pay you to haul it away? He said, how big is it? There was a little bit of a pause, and they said, well, we can't quite see the end of it. I guess they had a lot of boxes on it. But they realized that it was quite a gigantic instrument. And he said, oh, by the way, does it have a name? Oh, they opened it up and said, Chicker Ring. And he said, I'll be right up there. He went up pulled the action, saw that it was bright and in beautiful condition, looked at the absolute filth inside from the storage and coal dust and oil, and um, realized that he had a true time capsule. It was all there, just filthy. So he called his movers and they began to come up to move it to his shop. While he was preparing the instrument to be moved, he was thinking, I'll get it to the shop, and, you know, maybe I'll tune it up and see how it sounds. But he played some chords on it. And to his absolute astonishment, it was in perfect tune after a century of storage. And that is a testimony, if you will, to the quality of the original instrument. But also, if you think of it, to the quality of the tuning it was given right before it went into a hundred-year sleep. And um, I acquired the instrument four and a half, five years ago, started to restore it. And there was a, the restoration consisted only of removing this gigantic amount of black coal dust, oil dust, and other fill. We cleaned it. Uh, it was all there. It needed very little regulation, needed some of the ivories replaced, and they were replaced with original chickering ivories from instruments of the time. Um, and we simply began to reveal the rosewood underneath. This music desk was black. We didn't even know if this was black lacquer like this or whatnot. But as we began to scrape it, this pale rosewood became visible. The gold of the cast iron plate began to be visible. Uh, as the filth vanished, we saw the Chickling and Sons decal on the soundboard, which was intact and in wonderful condition. Um, and so it had everything original. And as we got to the end of the restoration here at the Lugura Center, the four-year restoration, uh, we realized that although the bass string sounded beautiful, they were dull, they were failing. And after 135 years, that certainly made sense. We then did some pretty intense detective work and we discovered that there is one firm in the world that will exactly copy the historic metal and fabrication techniques of 19th and early 20th century piano strings. So we sent off a sample, we measured the strings 
uh, and all their scaling, sent them off to Germany, got them back, put them on the piano, and we still have the originals. And what we now have basically is the, in uh, the instrument as it was shipped. The brand new string sound exactly as the old ones were supposed to. And uh, all of these functions of a concert grand piano, nine foot two of piano, suddenly were there and that is what we have been recording here today and during many other recording sessions. What is special about a piano like this, besides the fact that it survived from our time into our time, it is the fact that the instrument has a degree of color, a degree of control over dynamics and shadings that are simply not demanded of pianists today. It doesn't make it superior to pianos of our time. It simply means that by incorporating, incorporating this original aesthetic from the late 19th century, which Chickering, Mason and Hamlin, Bechstein, Steinway, Erard, Bösendorfer, Streicher, all the great makers had. Um, they had such individual character that people argued vigorously about the quality of the various different instruments. We have lost that. There is now essentially a single piano aesthetic in place. That's what students and uh, teachers know. So when people come here and discover an instrument like this or a comparable Steinway or a comparable Mason and Hamlin, they are astonished to be able to pull out a score and say, oh, wait a minute, play that. For the first time in my life, I can do exactly what the score asks for, and it makes sense. If you invest in the subtlety, in exploring the shadings, uh, it pays you back big time. <laughs>